communication and everything is very fast quick people having more time instead of that people are finding less and less and less time and same person is torn in multiple places it is what has happened with a secretary of gozima karana association and i am just here because she requested me she cannot be at the same place why to that so i am very happy to welcome all of you for dr ramprabhu oration and it is to be delivered by dr vikas kashyap there is a tradition to mention about a person who on whose name the oration is done and that's why for dr ram prabhu i don't need i to introduce but i just make a mention that he is a such a long list of achievements most important according to me is the gsi and he has studied here and he has achieved everything what you can in terms of professional expertise skills on one side and of course organization and like administration and his spine trauma advanced training in germany has gone for that and he has delivered lectures orations and participated in very simple to national he has held 200 workshops and many things has he has been president of indian orthopedic association of 2017 joint secretary of association of rural surgeons of india and of course he has co-authored four books <coughs> trauma management by jess has been awarded the author of best book award 2008 he has been reviewer of journal of joint bone and joint surgery He is the head of department at VM Desai Hospital for last 25 years. Medical director at Mukund Hospital, and he has done working on deformity of correction and development of newer and inexpensive indigenous techniques in orthopedics. And of course, his hobbies include mountaineering. He has gone to all Himalayas and Alps 20 times. and we seek and work and as per the protocol i'm supposed to now invite myself as a chairman and dr srivastava as a chairman please come over and we request dr agas the speaker to take dais please welcome them in class Now, Dr. Shivastu will introduce his speech. A very good afternoon to all of you, uh, all the respected presenters in the dais, my dear friends, and my other uh, seniors who are uh, sitting in the front chairs. 
Uh, it is uh, really my proud privilege to introduce Dr. Vikas Agarshi. Uh, not only an orthopedic surgeon, he is a very, very fine human being. And that's what I am seeing him since so many decades, I would say. Uh, he is alumnus of this institute. Uh, he joined uh, KM uh, 69 and then passed out at 78. So when he graduated his uh, MBBS course, I graduated, I finished my graduation in plain science at BSc. So that coincides with his seniority to me. And uh, we all always look towards him for many things. Uh, not only the he is a part of the Bombay Orthopedic Society, very integral part. Now regarding academics, anything it comes to tuberculosis or osteoporosis, he is always there standing behind all of us and uh, he guides us in each and every conference you will find his talk. Uh, he is national faculty in many of the conferences in India and abroad also. And we are really happy to welcome him here and he is going to deliver uh, his oration, that is Dr. Ram Prabhu oration. I, I welcome, personally welcome Dr. Agashe and his missus also. Uh, incidentally, Dr. Ram Prabhu's wife is also there. She is also a alumnus of this institute. Welcome, madam. I, I thank you very much for giving this time to us. Thank you. Respected uh, Professor Dr. Mehta, Dr. Ram Prabhu, Mrs. Prabhu, Dr. Srivastava, Dr. Monty, Dr. Thakur, many of my classmates, my friends, uh, Dr. Sunil Pandya, who was our professor at that time, good afternoon, sir. Um, and all my friends and colleagues. It's a great, great honor to deliver this Dr. Prabhu oration. It's exactly 50 years since I joined KM, is a photograph of our batch. 1973, with three of our teachers, Professor uh, K. D. Desai, Professor Ramchandani, and Dr. G. Pipalukar. Uh, you can see me here as well as my wife. So, so many years I used to think that one day I used to request God that one day give me a chance to stand here and speak in front of this honest captain, and I'm really thankful to. KM Nostalgia, KM Alumni for giving me this opportunity. At the outset, it may, I possibly may say something politically incorrect, but the time now is to discuss not who is right and wrong, but what is right and wrong. Friends, just about three decades from now, it is very likely that most deaths will be because of drug resistant infections. People say India is a gigantic petri dish that is resulting in highly pathogenic strains. There is a paper, there was a paper in 2016, the bias got worse, totally different, totally re drug resistant tuberculosis in India. And the recent paper, drug resistant tuberculosis, is India ready for the challenge? And the authors say no. Another part of it, woman dies after being infected by nightmare superbug from Delhi. And people have been saying that India is producing these organisms which are likely to spread the world. But many of you would think, why an orthopedic surgeon? I mean, orthopedics as a community know just one antibiotic. Why should we listen to drug resistance from orthopedic surgeons? Friends, things change and Bombay Orthopedic Society has changed tremendously. In fact, they have 
we have initiated a finance projects on osteoarticular tuberculosis, addressed the issue of poor culture yield in osteoarticular tuberculosis and for years we have been insisting and informing our, our members well, well before the government insisted that try and obtain culture in each and every case. Friends, this disease has fooled the mankind. I take you back to 60 plus years. This is Hunterian lecture by Professor Mukhopadhyay from Patna. And he said that every case he used to operate used to be subjected to histo, culture and guinea pig inoculation. They combined the anti-TB drugs those days and the routine use of anti-TB drugs was strikingly beneficial. Now we concluded by saying the struggle against tuberculous disease has been hard, long and costly but today we appear to be on threshold of success. So friends, 60 years ago people had dreamt that they have almost reached the success. With introduction of two new magic drugs, rifampicin and pyrazinamide, we felt we have won the war. And so for almost 30 years, TB appeared to be preventable, curable, no problem at all. People of my generation would say, oh, this is TB, no problem. MRI added to so-called accuracy and empirical treatment of osteoarticular TB became a routine. We, during that time, forgot the art and science of TB culture. So much so that this is a 2008 publication from a very prestigious institute from Delhi and they said the culture was positive only in 12% cases. And the very first line the author says, diagnosis of osteoarticular tuberculosis is clinical radiological in endemic areas. Friends, we were in fool's paradise. We thought we could easily diagnose TB Culture was hardly ever positive. MRI helps us tremendously. And empirical treatment of TB is extremely useful. We really didn't know at that time that TB had a very frightening companion and that's AIDS. So much so that people had said that tuberculosis is black death with wings. I'm sure many of you must have read this book, Time Bomb, The Global Epidemic of Multivirus Disease. So to continue things further, HIV those days meant hardly anything for us. I mean we thought, yes, troublesome, we have to do testing, disposable syringes to be used, use gloves, so on and so forth, and most of the private practitioners would shunt cases elsewhere. But we really didn't realize that it would make a tremendous impact on TV. <coughs> and we didn't know that there was a group of people from Mumbai, who were studying cases of HIV in Mumbai and they had a very high incidence of TB, extrapolated TB and registered TB. The study was subsequently published in 2006 but the title is very important, HIV and Tuberculosis Partners in Crime. So we didn't realize at that time the face of tuberculosis in Mumbai, India and world will change drastically. Our renaissance was in 2000. Two. I operated on a case of suspected cox ankle, something routine used to get so many cases these days and I operated after the surgery, I told you, no, everything has gone well, I will send for testing. said, sir, I hope you have sent the sample for culture. So I said, there is no need, I mean, there is no need. Nobody sends sample for culture because it is always negative. Very politely he said, sir, but if my, if the bugs are resistant to one of the drugs, what will happen to my wife? And she was lost for follow So I started thinking why did, why did I, what did I do wrong? So I thought, let me find out from my friends. Did a small pilot study and just two, two out of 60 were doing culture studies in tuberculosis at that time. Just two people. Rest felt that it may be useful but it was always negative. And one important thing they added, of late TB patients don't seem to be don't seem to respond as well as they used to do earlier. 
I asked them what do you use, how do you collect the samples and varied answers, swab from sinus, collect just the pus in test tube, FNSE, exhalation and aspirate, collection in formalin, so on and so forth. So, I realized the devil is culture, unmasked resistance. So we discussed, I discussed with Dr. Kamala Reddick and she said that you must improve, you can improve the yield provided you have an appropriate sample that has to be deep culture in adequate quantity, granular ship issue needs to be included in a sterile leak proof container and liquid medium. If you do that, you are very very likely to have a good culture yield. So in uh, annual general body meeting of Bombay Orthopedic Society, we proposed, I proposed and we started a project by Bombay Orthopedic Society and Hinduja Hospital. We initiated a project and Hinduja gave a handsome grant of 6.75 lakhs in 2004. So any member of BOS could send patients for sample collection or could send samples and Hinduja Hospital would do all the tests free. We, next few years, we circulated leaflets in various meetings, actually circulated containers to all the members of Bombay Orthopedic Society and insisted as to how to collect samples and send samples. And any patient with Cox was suspected or patient was on EKT or not improving, we would do the test. Aerobic as well as TB culture, sensitivity, PCR and histopathology. GN expert was not available then. We recently had the midget and that improved the sensitivity quite well. And as I said, patients didn't have to pay a single paisa for that. So what were the findings? As many as 12 out of 93 patients did not have tuberculosis. The most common was biogenic. And our culture yield had improved tremendously. 58% as opposed to 12% or 20% all over, all across India it used to be 12 or 20%, we had a culture yield of as much as 58%. 15 patients had resistance. The pattern varied significantly. Those days putting patients on streptomycin was very common and it was very common to have streptomycin resistance. And many patients had resistance to second drugs. Our youngest patients were just 18 months old. But most importantly we found was 50% patients were under the age of 10 years. And none of them was immunocompromised. This was one of our youngest patients, 18 months, who was never subjected to anti-TB drugs earlier. The first culture showed multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. So three patients had primary resistance, never subjected to AKP earlier. While 12 patients, it was probably missed primary resistance or secondary resistance. For example, this patient, 10 years old, initially started on ATT for pulmonary TB at regular intervals. She continued to develop tuberculosis at various regions, cervical dorsal spine, head humerus, dorsal lumbar spine as you can see and calcarium and invinal spine. So, for the first time through project, we did her culture sensitivity 28 months after uninterrupted anti-TB drugs. 28 months. And she was resistant to Isonex, Ephampicin and Interpetone. 11 patients had MDR and one was XTR. So, those days, empirical modification of TB was, anti-TB drugs was very common. And if you had followed that, almost 30 patients, percent patients would have had poor results. 12 who had other diagnosis and 15 who had resistance. So this was a unique study because various members contributed all across Mumbai and it was sponsored by a private hospital. And we published this in as our osteotic tuberculosis diagnostic solutions in a disease and endemic region in journal of infection in developing countries. How does this compare the resistance pattern compare with studies in developed world? It was vastly different from the data for resistant pulmonary tuberculosis. In our study, 
50% patients were under 10, while there the average is of 55. In ours, none of the patients were uh, HIV positive, while most patients were immunocompromised in other groups. So we realized that the pediatric population was developing primary resistance and a matter of great concern which we stressed in our paper. But all our patients were HIV negative, so how could we conclude that MDR increased because of immunodeficiency? I come back to that paper by then which was published in 2006, HIV and tuberculosis, partners in crime. They had, Mania and colleagues had screened more than 8,600 patients, HIV infected over six years. Tuberculosis was diagnosed on clinical radiological grounds and the incidence was 93%, of which 42% were pulmonary and 14% were disseminated. Sputum cultures were taken from them, 34% grew MTB and almost 500, close to 500 had resistance. No cultures were taken from patients who had extra pulmonary disease. Now what is important is according to the policies then all these patients irrespective of resistance were treated with standard four line, four drugs treatment, standard first line treatment, nine months for most of the cases and two years if it were spinal TB, osteoarticular TB or central nervous system TB. So all of them received standard anti-TB four line treatment whether they were resistant or not resistant. So obviously these patients who had resistance or patients who had masked resistance because cultures were not done, behaved like epicenters, spreading this disease, infecting others based on their immune system. Patients who had good resistance developed MDR primary complex. Patients who did not have good resistance develop full blown disease with resistant bacilli. And so children started getting primarily infected with drug resistant TB with frightening complications. And this was our next paper, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, is it the beginning of end. We also find, found out what, how much it cost. And it used to cost 3 to 5 lakhs for treatment in those days. And so we concluded that we need to take desperate measures to control spread of primary resistance. Unfortunately, due to existing policies then, empirical treatment of osteoarticular tuberculosis continued, empirical modification of ATT also continued. So Bombay Orthopedic Society financed, initiated and financed another project, 2010-11. They gave a grant of 12 lakhs plus a friend of mine, Dr. Thakkar, gave another 1 lakh. And the idea was to find out why patients are not responding with anti-TB drugs. And any member again of Bombay Orthopedic Society all across Mumbai could send samples. I would see them in my pneumopedia and we would do these studies. All tests were done. Some of the examples, glaring examples. This one year old child had infective arthritis of the hip with progressive destruction of fever. Diagnosed here TB hip and TB meningitis six months ago, empirical. Empirical treatment, dots one given, did not work, dots two given. Nobody had realized that his uncle had active cox and had died in recent. And you can see one year old child resistant to several drugs. Hardly any options. The worst is yet to come. This 17 year old boy had tuberculosis of foot and tibia. He had completed two years of ATT two years ago and then developed these regions and presented to the project eight months later because he was not settling. And he was registered to 11 drugs. This was around 2011. We could arrange for private donors and treat him and he was ever grateful to Bombay Orthopedic Society. We are analyzing this data including long term results. Again, 12 patients had uh, other diagnosis, but what was important was the resistance pattern had worsened significantly. 
And then a paper which caused political storm was published by Dr. Zahir Udwariya, totally drug resistant tuberculosis in Mumbai or in India. And he presented four papers, four patients who had resistance to first as well as second line treatment. They were treated by multiple private practitioners with absolutely inappropriate treatment. But what happened was the agencies felt that TDR is a misnomer. In theory, yes, but what is important was this page, these patients had resistance to 12 to 14 drugs, and that would be a just epicenter of storm. And the second week, the next following line, the bag just got worse. And he calls it public policy paralysis for years. For years together, this, if a patient failed to respond to standard four drug regime, CAT 1, instead of doing culture studies, he would be put on CAT 2. And in most cases, it served to amplify their resistance. And Dr. Gwadia says private system is equally to blame and the TB patients really struggled to stay afloat between uncaring public system and unregulated and exploitative private system. And what was the outcome? 2018, I saw this patient, February 2018, tuberculosis in the ankle. The first, she had never taken TB treatment in the past. So this was a primary resistance. The first culture showed that she was resistant to 11 drugs and sensitive only to two drugs. Hardly any options available. Empirical treatment had to be given. Her father flew to Japan because he could afford and got Vedaquilin and Delaminant. All that because he could afford. But you know how much he spends per month? 150,000 rupees a month he is spending on drugs alone in addition to medical treatment, other treatment. So what can happen if this continues? 2017 paper says that modeling studies estimate that majority of TB in India by 32 will be MDR all due to primary transmission. All of us, all of them would be infected with primarily resistant bacteria. Yes, the tide may change. 16 onwards, there are some very important changes. Every TB is to be notified, culture study is to be encouraged and modification as per DST. And yes, the government, the health, health officials feel that we should make a desperate attempt to eliminate TB from India in 2025. Friends, unfortunately, is a pincer attack by microbes. The other are gram negative bacilli. 20, 20, 2007 paper, a step closer to extreme drug resistance in gram negative bacilli. As you can see, it is becoming clear that we are heading towards a similarly extreme drug resistance in gram negative conditions. You will not believe, nine years ago, Zappi published an editorial. The title was Obituary, Obituary on the Death of Antibiotics. This was in response to several publications related to the Delhi Superbug. And the editor says that this is a major blow to modern man's arrogance. Arrogance that he has conquered bacterial infections. If you trace the history of antibiotics, you would see within no time the antibiotics, the bugs develop resistance to it. Here you can see Ceftriaxone within two years bacteria develop resistance. Linezone just a year, Daptomycin just a year. In addition to that, and why does this happen? Because we use antibiotics, and we use antibiotics indiscriminately, without any definite policy. The most expensive one, oh, this costs 4300 rupees a day. So this has to be the best antibiotic. And, and what is the result? The result is these bugs which can cause or have a mortality of 25 to 50 percent. And that's a very scary, scary thing. Added to that, 
farmers have sort of slowed down antibiotic production. So we are going to be in big, big trouble. Anyone would say, why? How does it affect? How do these superbugs affect us? And why need? So we all know that normal bacterial flora have standard, protein, common cells, and many of them are good boys, produce vitamin K, they protect gut membrane. They do. Yes, together they have been causing hospital acquired infection, but they have been susceptible to antibiotics. And they have been susceptible for ages. Indiscriminate use of antibiotics killed these susceptible organisms over a period of time. So thus, the gut had all bad boys <coughs> became resistant to antibiotics. And finally, the carbapenem which would normally work, they would produce, they produce a gene called metallopetalactamase 1 and the carbapenem was no more useful. These bugs would pollute water supply and reservoir in asymptomatic patients which would lead to a resistant healthcare infection. So this was first described in 2009 and these were picked up from drinking water in Delhi and there were several papers uh, related to that. But the first one was Lan Lancet 2011 paper and the authors named this gene as New Delhi Meta metallo metallectomase 1. And they said this is a great public hazard and singled out India as a focal point of this epidemic. And whatever reason, the bug started getting known as the new Delhi superbug. So the world started blaming us for this resistance. And there was a violent reaction from government as well as opposition parties. Everybody had the pride of India. And they said that you cannot name this as Delhi superbug. So finally, Lancet editor said, okay, it was a mistake, but the co-author said that you should not be in state of denial. Doing something is in your own interest. We, he says, I really don't know why Indians are trying to push it under the carpet. And they should realize that hospital acquired infections will be virtually untreatable. And on the other side, the Indians said, that why should you blame India, why should you name it as India or New Delhi? Because once upon a time, Mongolism, which was popularly known as Mongolism, was named as Down syndrome. Change, his name was change. And he also said there are several flaws, these, these infections have happened earlier, etc., etc. Let's forget the politics. What does it mean to us? It means that if you see this map, India, in India, the Klebsiella resistance to carbapenem is close to 60% as compared to just 5% in Europe. So in the hierarchy, if pan-susceptible can have a number of drugs available. Once cephalosporins, they become resistant to cephalosporin, hardly anything. And when bugs become carbapenem resistance, you have hardly anything. You have these three or four antibiotics which have tremendous, tremendous toxic effects. So many times we had to stop these antibiotics because of this. And all this is because of easy access, we have no antibiotic policy, poor use of diagnostic tools and in most of the surgical branches it is poor source control. When it comes to infections, we become many physicians, start antibiotics and not address the source. So we presented this in uh, 2017 18 Asia Pacific Conference and got the best paper award. We analyzed 92 patients of gram negative infections over 16 years. Comorbidity is very, very common, various causes, but what we found was 70% patients were on empirical antibiotics when they presented to us. Most of the infections. Most of the patients had many, many bacteria, polymicrobial uh, infections. If you see the resistance in these 90 odd patients, multi-drug resistance was close to 55-53% and 28% patients 
or isolates rather, were resistant to carbapenem and that's a very very high percentage. 4% patients had nothing there, nothing. Not even cholesterol was sensitive. And why is it important? Close to 30% patients had a functional failure. And this data is almost similar, in fact little better than the rest of the world. We had close to 10% mortality, amputations, excision of bones had to be done in 9%, 10% of the cases. Fracture healing was achieved only in 72% cases. So overall, the failure rate was close to 30%. Now question is how do we turn the tide? How do we turn the pain these microbes? Is there a magic wand? Friends, it's just small, boring, incremental changes. We need to address established infection, prevent infection and prevent resistance. Must think global but act local. First and foremost, stop denial policy. Stop thinking that we do not have a problem. We have a major problem. Antibiotics is not a replacement for appropriate infection control practices of sterilization and horticulture. We must decrease hospital acquired infections using proper hand hygiene and contact isolation. Especially surgeons should become cultured, try to obtain tissue sample for in every case of infection. We proposed uh, and started using what is called a six-legged concept in management of these difficult infections, radical debridement, soft tissue cover, appropriate microbiology or histopathology studies, appropriate targeted antibiotics, local antibiotics, support or fixation, tabletop, very important, right compromise at the right time, and most important, take care of the dead weight, that is comorbidities, nutrition and tobacco. For example, this patient, very bad infection, and you can see almost there is nothing left in the leg, but with aggressive deprivement, we had a huge defect. Now with today's technology, we can do wonders with this. There is a huge defect, no gastronomias, no nerves, and we could shorten him, repair the nerves, repair gastronomias, and then at a later date, when crisis was tied over, we lengthened him proximally and equalized his limb length. This is post nailing, post lengthening and post nailing, and this is him at 18 months with good sensations in the leg, heel fracture, and an excellent function. This is at seven years, he is doing almost everything. The notable exception to this aggressive deprivement is tuberculosis. Most tuberculosis patients, osteoarticular also, respond to appropriate medicines for appropriate time because it's a medical disease. Once upon a time, bugs were obedient. Today they defy your orders. Empirical drugs work then. Today, drugs are governed by microbes. Once upon a time, IV and microbiology departments had practically no role. They were at the corner of a building. Today, they play a very major role in any hospital setup. We as surgeons also should know a bit about antibiotics. The only thing we should know, or at least two things we should know, is one, prophylactic antibiotics are given before microbes enter in a clean surgery. Should not be used beyond 12 hours and should be large factor. They are not the same as targeted antibiotics after the infection is established into the body and which is as per the culture studies on a long term basis. And we should also know that most antibiotics have collateral damage, higher does not mean better. We must know that the havoc has already started. This is 2016 Lancet paper. They followed up more than 80,000 neonates in Delhi from neonatal care units. 80,000 neonates were followed up and they said Klebsiella pneumonia infection in newborn babies is virtually untreatable and it is a threat that 
which is a return of pre-antibiotic era in India's neonatal intensive care units. So what has happened in intensive care units is very likely to happen all over in all the branches of medicine. So friends, medical, paramedical community, KMAs, hospital administration, everybody has to realize that the situation is beyond pulling up socks. We need to actually pull up our trousers. And if appropriate measures are not taken, even if man develops kingopenum or gorilla mycin, however strong these antibiotics may be, people will die of infection of simple LACS or radius splitting. The warning by WHO long ago that our time with antibiotics is running out. To conclude, friends, we are on the brink of defeat against microbes. Pre-streptomycin era for TB or pre-penicillin era for gram-negative infections is a distinct threat. Small incremental steps need to be taken by all agencies. And if not, the third or fourth world war will not be needed to finish off human population. The need of our is documentation and research for Indian soil and world. People, especially I was thinking that some students would come over and I would say that don't worry about funds because just to say again what Pandit Madan Mohan Malviya had said once upon a time. Dunya mein dene walo ki kami nahi hai. Kami hai un hathu ki jo unhe swikar kar sakai. So there is no problem as far as funding for research is concerned. But we all need to wake up because otherwise these microbes will just fail. Thank you very much.
you have to change the basic tendency of doctors as well as uh, patients of over dependence on antibiotics simple viral infection we have been taught that for 72 hours it is not possible for you to diagnose but rather than waiting for that people start pumping antibiotics patients also doctor why are not given the antibiotic so that pressure is there right from family physician all the way up secondly the pharma companies are also pushing their new antibiotics so aggressively giving all sorts of benefits so that the family physicians also start jumping the queue and start using highest possible antibiotic for what various reason so that is the for a time ground for creating drug resistance so that basic concept in our teaching program also has to be there and in cme also we have to say that you can't start antibiotic unless you have come to a diagnosis people use antibiotics for short if you have antibiotic and if it doesn't respond then they will start looking for a diagnosis the pediatric society of india has such set protocols and we are also in process of setting an osteoarticular infection society of india where we will in, inform people as to how to manage these infections and some set protocols for management one point here most important thing is gps gps have to be informed even trained or even future doctors other thing is awareness in the public i don't know how much awareness is being created on through media televisions for you know what are we the government has to really work hard on the awareness this public is equally responsible today uh, my neighbor says oh i got a cough he goes and buys a department in the shop and this is good going i think now reduce now i think it's not very easy to get into bargains but all these years which i have been observing it was freely available if i want a mask and just go to the shop and get it so i think two area which are so important one is the gp they form a big chunk of society they just use antibiotics without any discussion and the public so i would rather focus on a public more i'll invest from the government side from the private sector go and do it on the televisions they are watching serials for hours together how much is being shown about the health of the can you tell me in 24 hours program show me a single channel which comes and say talks about one hour i would say because the best thing we can do to our country to improve the health system and the thing you're talking about is a bomb shit it's a bomb and i've been realizing this in the last 20 years because i'm away but i'm connected to india through all so i think the most important thing i understand and i think i'm right the awareness program should be multiplied spending money you spend a lot of money on there rather than uh, you know talking only doctors the doctor doctor is important but public is equally important thank you Dr. Vikas, you had a wonderful um, lecture, but you scared me to death today. You know, with the fact like, I mean, are we all going to the next surgery? If I have to have, am I going to die? You know, the real thought really provokes you and makes you think. I completely agree with Prem uh, that public awareness has to be like even if it is Amitabh Bachchan, every. serial after that he screams his head off and says if we don't look after we all going to die of tuberculosis this is the only way to tell people to stop spitting treat their cough seriously and if we find a neighbor or if we find someone in and around us we should insist that he takes treatment maybe even at our own cost maybe it's the people who work in your house live in your building or you see someone across unless this sort of uh, thing is not taken by the public because you can't expect government and municipality to do everything you know this cleaning campaign also people say municipality ka job hai what is municipality it is us if we don't take it in our hands we are doomed forever other thing because he mentioned see we also have a nursing home around 30 bed nursing home i attended the ward office meeting you know to understand what facilities the ward office is giving all of us and you will everyone should know that theoretically everything is in place chemists are appointed and drugs of good quality are given to any patient you 
have been able to identify as tuberculosis of any part, whether it is chest or your osteoarticular or anything. There are certain forms to be filled, there are agencies who are appointed for that. Chemists have been told if you come with, you know, um, your um, prescription paper and you find that it has not been notified to the ward office, the doctor is penalized. The first thing anyone wants to penalize a doctor, it's very easy, not the person who's sick or got from someone who's sick. I went to this ward office meeting myself to understand how I can help patients in my area. The ward office meeting was a complete chaos. We were all talking to each other, more interested in distributing lunch packets, more interested in talking of anything but how in simple form, first and foremost their own papers are completely in Marathi, in a very very hazy thing. So, most people who have studied medicine, I don't think anyone really understands every word of even shay rog. You know, I don't think half the people here know that it's tuberculosis. So, all these things have to be addressed by like BOS, Dynax Society, everybody. Take it up as a, on a warm footing. Because the way you have told us, 2025 Chodo, I think we are going to exit having TB, which could be, you know, something could be cured. Last year I would say, you can save the cancer. Incidentally, I am working for prevention of cancers for last now nearly 15 years. And the lack of support I have seen, both in municipal medical colleges and also in the private and also the government medical colleges. And I have no shame to say this. There was total lack of cooperation. I have been talking about this for 15 years to politicians. Forget the colleges, politicians, to health ministers. They have no interest. They are ready to spend crores on MRIs, CT scans, putting those machines for cancer treatment. But they are not, not interested in prevention. I don't work for treatment, sorry. I work for prevention. And I'm shocked. The prevention is the first thing, common sense. You spend 30 billion, say, rupees or 30 crores on treating the patients. If you prevent it, you save money. So where are we? I mean, I am an Indian first and always will be Indian first. So, because I love my country, I think people like you who are in a position, you must shake up the government. It's no point just we discussing in the closed room or even Hindu are discussing in the closed room. Sorry, we have to shake up the government. So look, wake up now. Bring it to the media. Because prevention can't say either because from the media. Why don't you have a dedicated channel for health? Why can't government do that? Why are you only focusing on some silly programs, Bollywood songs, dances, what? This is what you want to move to our children? I mean, it's, it's something so important that not only what you spoke about TV today, cancer is ever killer. People don't have money, they save their houses. They, they lose all your income. But the government is not working on prevention the way they should be working. I'm not trying to criticize anybody here. I'm trying to say, this is a lot of uh, chance for us to do it now, not wait for the 20 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, sir. Actually, now we have another program. So, now I request uh, our chairperson to uh, present a moment to Dr. Vikash Agashi. Thank you very much.